Good evening to you all. And from wherever you are joining us remotely, we're very glad to have you with us tonight. I'm Beverly Wendland, Provost of Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's event sponsored by the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. Our event tonight is called Interpersonal Relations Across Political Divides, People of Faith Building Bridges from Polarization to Reconciliation. Before we begin tonight's discussion, I would like to share with you some information about the center. The center is comprised of a dedicated group of scholars and professionals working to support outstanding analysis of the historical and contemporary intertwining of religion and politics. Its aim is to educate students and the public through courses, publications, and events like this one all while modeling public, all while modeling um, discussion and debate that values each person's humanity at the cornerstone of a productive democracy. I imagine this audience needs no reminder of the critical importance of such efforts in today's environment. And we are fortunate to have these faculty members working on working in this space here at Washington University. Today's event is particularly special because it features the center's inspiration and namesake, St. Louis's own John C. Danforth. Senator Danforth is an ordained Episcopal priest and a former U.S. Senator from Missouri who has had a long and distinguished political career. He has long been a sound source of wisdom concerning today's urgent and ever timely topic of building bridges from polarization to reconciliation. And the center has been fortunate in being able to host occasional public conversations between Senator Danforth and other eminent guests. With him in conversation today is his very good friend and a renowned educator, writer, and public thinker, Father Matt Malone. Father Malone is the president and editor-in-chief of America Media and a Jesuit priest with a lengthy record of service and contributions of his own in the areas of religious education and journalism. Beyond his work at America Media, where he covered US politics and foreign affairs from 2007 to 2009, his writing has appeared in numerous national and international publications, and he's been featured in the New York Times and the Washington Post, among others. I want to welcome both of you to Washington University and say how pleased I am that we can host you together. Thank you so much for being here. And so now I want to turn things over to today's moderator, Marie Griffith, who is the John C. Danforth Distinguished Professor in the Humanities here at Washington University. She also directs the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. Marie. Thank you so much, uh, Provost Wendland. And thank you to all of you who are joining us via Zoom and YouTube for this special discussion between Senator John Danforth and Father Matt Malone, uh, which will last about an hour. As many of you know, our Center on Religion and Politics offers a wide and diverse array of programming, hosting scholars and professionals of many kinds, lawyers, journalists, and political figures, for instance, for public events like this one. We also bring religious leaders across many faith traditions, sometimes to converse across religious divisions and sometimes to discuss matters within a shared religious tradition. And so today we bring together two leaders within the Christian tradition, although from different branches of Christianity. As the provost just noted, Senator Danforth is an ordained Episcopal priest who has presided over many religious occasions and ceremonies including notably officiating at the funeral of Ronald Reagan. And Father Malone is a Roman Catholic priest whose influence from his post as president and editor in chief at America Media is vast. Both have written for broad public audiences, books, essays, editorials, you name it. In a Wall Street Journal opinion piece that they co-authored together last fall, the two write the following. Today, a growing number of Americans regard their political opponents not as fellow citizens with whom they disagree, but as enemies, as politically, socially, and even morally irredeemable. Millions of Americans consume news in echo chambers, while countless numbers have lost friends or even turned away from family over political disagreements. The two leaders then turn to a discussion of the Christian practices in both their churches that may provide a practical model for reducing polarization. 
and transform the tone of politics, a step they write toward bridge building and away from confrontation. Together they declare Christians have a mandate to take up such a ministry of reconciliation to help heal this country. Senator Danforth and Father Malone have continued their dialogue since that time, and we're very fortunate to have this opportunity to listen and engage with them, learn from them, and who knows, maybe we can even contribute something to their thinking. Those of you on Zoom can use the Q&A feature to send in questions for them to address if we have time. And thanks to uh, several of you who sent questions in advance, we'll try to get to those as well. So send a question anytime uh, while, while we're going. Now, I just wanna take a couple of final minutes here at the outset to give a kind of overview of the problem that they are tackling as context for our conversation. How polarized are we really? Here's some data for you. According to a recent analysis by the Public Religion Research Institute, 81% of Republicans say that Democratic Party has been taken over by socialists. And 78% of Democrats feel that the Republican Party has been taken over by racists. Just two weeks ago, the Pew Research Center released a report on the media echo chambers on both the left and the right. The report analyzed the Americans who in 2020 consistently got their news only from these echo chambers or primarily from them. And it won't surprise you to hear that the report concluded misinformation and competing views of reality abound. But what Americans categorized as made up news varied widely and often aligned with partisan views. In other words, fake news is everywhere. Everyone agrees about that but we disagree about what's fake and what's true. Now, it'd be one thing if the people holding these competing and highly partisan views of reality could nonetheless get along and love one another. But the greater problem, greater even than the fact of political polarization, is the forceful breakdown in our personal relationships that has resulted. Consider the issue of unfriending, unfollowing, and blocking people on social media because what they posted about politics. Father Malone wrote about this issue in his wonderful essay, Pursuing the Truth in Love, noting that social media often exacerbates existing ideological partisan divisions by confirming only those viewpoints with which we are already more inclined to agree. And another expert writes, both sides tend to view themselves as eminently fair and right, and the other side as irrational. We're flattening people out in terms of our view of them. And we're not really seeing the full complexity of people on the other side. And just to conclude with a couple of more data points here, in November, the Conservative Institute for Family Studies estimated that 79% of American marriages are comprised of couples who share the same political party identification. Now, 21% are mixed, but most of the mixed marriages are between partisans and independents rather than Democrats and Republicans. This is the result of a steady drop in the share of politically mixed marriages and a corresponding rise in Americans' intolerance toward interpolitical marriage. Democratic parents don't want their kids marrying Republicans and vice versa. Finally, a recent civility poll out of Georgetown University found that the average voter believes the US is two thirds of the way to the edge of a civil war. The good news from that poll is that eight in 10 voters want compromise and common ground, eight in 10. That is very good news indeed. So with all of this in mind, I want to turn to you, Senator Danforth and Father Malone, and ask what you think about this. So Senator, let's start with you. Do you think I've given an accurate depiction of today's political polarization and its very negative impact on personal relationships? And, and what more would you want to say about the situation? Well, Marie, you have done such a good job of teeing up the discussion. I don't know what to add. <laughs> I think you've done it. Um, no, I think this is absolutely right. It's um, I, had a, I had a conversation not long ago with a man who used to work with me when I was in the Senate, maybe three or four decades ago, and he stayed on in politics and in government, and he's a 
big observer of the U.S. Senate over a very long period of time. And he said, you know, the problem now is that people in the Senate don't just disagree with each other, they hate each other. That's a big deal because it's very hard to come together on anything politically. And that's what politics is, right? It's trying to figure out how to put policy together. It's very difficult to do that if people hate each other. They just can't stand being with each other. Another friend of mine who is still in the Senate told me that he couldn't think of five people, colleagues of his, whom he would like to have over to his house for dinner. It's a very, very big deal and a very big change for, you know, I mean, you reach a certain point and you talk about the good old days and I think about the good old days and they were good in the US Senate. I loved being there when I did it. But now two things, one, people do, I think, hate each other. And secondly, they don't really do anything. So the system now malfunctions. It's a dysfunctional Senate. It's a dysfunctional gov government. I think most people realize that. And I think it, part of it, a lot of it is brought about by this extreme polarization, which is individualized where people just uh, don't want to be in the same room with each other. Yeah, Father Malone, could you speak to this as well? And, and I know you've written about this in that wonderful essay, Pursuing the Truth in Love and many other places. Why have we become so polarized and why is this such a threat? Well, first of all, I, I should say thank you for inviting me to, uh, into this conversation. But the reason it's such a threat, uh, just at a political level is because you know, according to your uh, statistics, or the statistics that you cited, you, we, have a, we have a majority of Democrats who think that Republicans are racist, and a majority of Republicans who think that Democrats are socialists, and a majority of Americans who are neither racist nor socialist. So they are not represented in some way, at least according to people's perceptions, in either of our major parties. But that signals a real breakdown. Um, it's evidence of the of the profound polarization that we have in our country. And the constitutional arrangements of the American Republic are organized around uh, systems that are meant to produce compromise, to, that are meant to, to make the many one, as in the national motto. Um, so that is the profound threat on a, on a, on a political level. I'd say that the, the second, there are a number of reasons why um, this polarization exists. But I would say that, that, that one of the main causes, in addition to the others, but this is the one I'll address, is the one that you cited, which is um, how information is consumed. Um, we forget sometimes newspapers, magazines, cable news channels, they can do great and noble things. Uh, journalists do great and noble things every day but they also exist to create mass markets for advertisers. And in, in, a, in, a, in a marketplace where um, the, the attention is so diffused, where there are so many different media platforms, the way that you build that market for advertisers is, is by slicing off different parts of demographic. So in other words, back in the day when there were three major television networks, the way you built a network was by bringing together liberals and Republicans and the Midwest and the Northeast and so forth around respected incredible figures it was not a problem free, free model by any stretch of the imagination, but it worked on one level. Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson, who agreed on nothing, both watched Walter Cronkite. And so they, at least they had the same information in, uh, when they were engaged in their debate. And I think a lot of us aren't aware even beyond newspapers, magazines, cable television, of how our own news feeds uh, in social media are structured. That they, in Facebook and in Twitter and so forth, they're also in the business of creating markets for advertisers. And the way that they do that, the way that they group us is uh, through a system of algorithms, complex digital formulas. Um, so that when I like somebody, so when I like something I see say on Facebook or on Twitter, it starts sending me more of that content 
and connecting me with other people who like that. Now, that doesn't sound like such a bad thing in the abstract, and it isn't, uh, but a, 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 that, that force has the effect of uh, ensuring that we're only exposed to ideas, opinions, and people with whom we're already inclined to agree. And <clears throat> so it's not the fact that we've given up on the idea that there are objective facts. Most people still believe that there are facts and objective realities. They, they disagree about what the objective reality is because they're, they're in a, uh, they're basically in silos separated from one another and not looking at the same data. And you know, my third point would be simply that there is a distinctive, I think, Christian call in all of that. Um, in the end, we as a, who profess to be disciples of Jesus Christ um, are, are called to, 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 to love our enemies. Right? I, don't tend, I don't think of any um, you know, uh, decent American as my enemy by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, as, as Senator Danforth just said, many people do, even in the United States Senate. And so what the, the questions that, that the Senator and I have been raising, first in the Wall Street Journal and then elsewhere, have to do with what can we specifically as Christians drawing on our tradition um, offer to, as a solution to this problem, a solution that could be accessible to non-Christians too. Yeah, and I very much, I want us to get to that. I, I just, a couple more short questions about the polarization itself and how we got here. I guess, you know, thinking, and Senator, I might direct this at you because uh, I know you've thought about this a lot. What do you think are the trends that have exacerbated this problem really on both the right and the left uh, as you see it? One, I think, is that um, politics has become too much. Um, instead of just being a part of life, it's been all consuming. And it's become, um, for I think a lot of us, what Tillich referred to with regard to faith when he said ultimate concern, faith is a matter of what's your ultimate concern. I think people are inundated by politics now. The 24 hour news channel, Twitter, all of this is relentless so that instead of, as Father Malone said, instead of a half an hour watching news with everybody watching the same thing, it's now all the time. And every news program is breaking news. Everything is breaking. Everything is hyper urgent. So um, it, it's very, if politics becomes everything, then it, it pushes aside other things, namely family, namely interpersonal relationships, friendships, everything else. So if people immediately start lining up in a partisan way or in a political way and not in a personal way, it creates this animosity, this anger which in turn feeds dysfunction in politics. I think that's where we are now. But I think that's a very, very big thing that, that it's become too much. I've, I've told this story before in one of our programs at, at Washington University, but it involves an election that I, oh, I thought I was gonna lose it, I didn't, but I thought I was gonna lose in this election and I was, I guess, showed my anxiety and my then 15 year old daughter, Dee Dee, said to me, well, it's not the World Series. And that's, a, that's true. I mean, politics isn't the World Series and it certainly isn't religion and it certainly isn't ultimate concern. And to make it so, is to create this situation that we have now, which doesn't work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Father Malone, just on this point about interpersonal relationships, and you know, of course, all of us have thought so much about this in the past year, when interpersonal relationships have been so difficult to sustain, and so many of us are isolated and lonely, and and maybe appreciate those interpersonal relationships all the more. 
But to this point the Senator is making about uh, the importance of interpersonal relationships, how important they are to making politics itself work and our larger civil society. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Sure. Uh, but I, I, I think the Senator is absolutely right in that we are in a situation where a kind of personal politics is uh, impossible um, because of all of the forces that we've been talking about. And, you know, David Brooks, uh, from a, a columnist for the New York Times said, I think it was about two years ago in one of his columns, something that just really rang true with me. He said, you know, if we're, if we're going to, um, we're going to save our republic, politics has to become less important. And, uh, and that's because of precisely what Senator Danforth is talking about. The, the, the whole political system is not designed for us to be obsessed with politics 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's always been a certain viciousness, nastiness, incivility in American politics. Historians will tell you tale after tale about what Jefferson said about Adams and Adams said about Jefferson. It's nasty stuff. But at the end of the day, you cast your votes and um, the world went on. People went back to their homes, they went back to their farms, they went back to their shops, and they didn't think about politics until two years later when they had to vote for Congress again, uh, or four years later when they had to vote for president, uh, presuming that they had the vote. Uh, the, the problem today is that, um, as I said, that the whole constitutional arrangement of the country is not designed to support a, a world in which politics is our principal pastime. And this, this converges with another, an, another reality, which I think of from a theological point of view, which is we live in an increasingly secularized world in which people are not, um, you know, people have, have values. Most people have decent values around love and justice, and friendship and so forth. Um, but they have become disillusioned with organized religion of every kind. Um, and the data shows that. Um, in, a, in a world in which people are uh, cut off from communities or, or ways of thinking about, about the transcendent, right, then what is immediate and material and here and now becomes all the more important. And that raises the stakes of our politics, right? So in other words, our disagreements then, because if what is here and now is what is most important, then our disagreements become uh, not a thorn in the side, it becomes a dagger in the heart. And increasingly, politics takes on this kind of liturgical quality and uh, the symbols and, uh, uh, of politics become sacralized and, and politicians almost are seen as oracles of truth in some way, uh, in the way that priests and ministers and rabbis used to be. That, it, that's a dangerous trend um, because the, the entire constitutional system of the country presupposes that that's a kind of data, that's a kind of meaning um, that Americans are going to find somewhere else, not in politics, not in government, but somewhere else. And uh, that's why there's a First Amendment. Mm. Well, yeah, let's, let's pursue this about religion and um, you know, I'm very mindful that religion sometimes has a very negative impact on politics. And Senator Danforth, your 2006 book, Faith and Politics, focused a lot on, on what had been wrong with, you know, certain ways of thinking about religion and politics. But, uh, you know, Christianity and, and really all religious traditions, we could be talking about any religious tradition uh, here, and, and really, I think, secular humanism, too. But um, what does Christianity have to say to all of this? Uh, Senator Danforth, you wrote a great deal about this in your most recent book, The Relevance of Religion, which was much more about the positive uh, contributions of Christianity. So talk to us about the traditional religious values that you think should have a prominent role in America's politics. If you accept the kind of facts that you laid out, Marie, in your introduction, and you're concerned that we become terribly polarized as a country and that it's caused a breakdown in politics and in how government should work and also 
a breakdown in interpersonal relationships, then the question is, what do we do about it? I mean, is there, what do we say? What do we do? And is there something or are there some things that Christians have to say that nobody else is saying? And that that therefore become, should become our ministry. So it's not that Christianity or religion presents itself kind of exclusively, you know, we're in, you're out. It's the opposite of that. It's, a, it's an outreach. It's a, it's a ministry that, that we think that we have, or at least I think should think that we have to the country as a whole, which is in St. Paul's phrase, a ministry of reconciliation, that we, from the standpoint of our religious faith, speaking from our faith, are ministers of reconciliation and that we have a responsibility to the country to be a healing presence in our country. I believe that's true. I think that there are the real things that we have to say that nobody else is saying. And um, that this is, this is our, should be our gift. Now it is certainly true that the history of religion has been the opposite. It's been divisive. People have killed each other, believing that it's God's will to do that. Religious wars were very much in the minds of the framers of our Constitution, particularly when in the writing of the First Amendment to the Constitution, the religious clauses, they were very concerned about the harm that religion could do. And that is true. And it is very possible to use religion today, and it is used to create wedge issues that simply rile up the base, that make people mad, us against them. But the opposite is also possible. And it's possible to see religion as a binding force and something that holds us together and a ministry that we have to try to hold together a fracturing country. Mm. Uh, Father Malone, I'd love to hear your, your response to that. And I just want to add something uh, to what the Senator said. Um, looking at your essay, Pursuing the Truth in Love, which I know is also America Magazine's motto, um, you, you wrote this, if we are to avoid further narcissistic dis divisions in the church or secular society, then we must proceed in a penitential key from our powerlessness from a lived acknowledgement of the sheer gratuity of our creation and redemption. I just, I think that is so beautiful. So I just wanted to add that in as something that I think is a very Christian sentiment that you've uh, raised in, in that point. Thank you. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, not only is that proceeding in that penitential key, the mandate I think we receive by virtue of our faith as Christians. And in that essay, I was speaking primarily to a Christian audience. Um, but it was also, it's also the only way that we're going to be credible. Because if, if, if we enter into this conversation, proceed in this discourse uh, as just one more force organized for public action and aligned with one party or the other, we're not going to succeed. We have to bring that part of our tradition that is, that is, that is strongest and most unique to us. And in, in my mind, that is, it is, is, is is the fact that we, we believe that we are created in love and we are redeemed in love. And so the witness, the political witness of Christians, have, it has to be, it has to visibly be uh, that of people who believe that they are created and redeemed in love. Um, I mean, I, I agree with what um, Senator Danforth said. I would, I would place a little bit different emphasis on it in that <clears throat> the it, it, there, there's no doubt that people of every faith and within every religion uh, have uh, created conflict and driven conflict uh, and aligned in conflicts uh, throughout history. Um, it's also the case that the that you know the most violent conflicts in human history have been that were in the name of the state, right? Um, and that that's an important piece, not as a historical argument, but from, from my point of view, the, the, the more uh, profoundly challenging issue here 
is, is not how uh, various religious figures uh, and groups have disfigured American politics or have made it more combative or tribal, which is undoubtedly true. It's how has this all consuming um, political warfare actually disfigured our faith communities, right? Um, so that our faith communities, which are by design meant to transcend these divisions, right, uh, are, are, are simply caught up in them. So in my own church, the Catholic church, these, these endless debates, can you be a Catholic and be a Democrat? Can you be a Catholic and be a Republican? Um, you know, a real Catholic wouldn't support this legislation. A real Catholic would oppose this legislation. But what that tells me is that the whole terms of our conversation are just baptized versions of the terms of our secular conversation. Um, that's bad for churches and faith communities uh, generally, but it's, it's even worse if you consider um, that we're, we're called to and somehow try to fix the problem on the secular side. So the, the first thing that we have to do is, is, is clean up our own house and recognize that, that we've been co-opted in this extraordinarily powerful national force. Well, a, a number of our attendees have uh, pointed out in the Q and A uh, the significance of abortion as um, you know one of these very very deeply divisive issues. And um, you know, if if either of you have thoughts on on that particular issue and how to resolve some of that, I know they'd love to hear uh, some some of that. I will also say we had uh, one of our students, a religion and politics minor, who's really interested in your thoughts, Senator Danforth, on the future of conservatism and the sort of perversion of it uh, that I think you have expressed very recently in some of your uh, public writings, um, which is another really interesting point. But to, to hold on to this religion thread uh, for a minute, we also have a number of people who wrote to us in advance and are writing here who note that they're secular uh, themselves and, um, and also deeply love their country and are also profoundly concerned about the issues that we're raising uh, here tonight. And so I guess I'd be interested, and Senator, I'll start with you, in how you know a very Christian message um, translate uh, to all Americans, Muslim, Jewish, uh, you know, whatever, a secular, atheist, um, and, and how you create that, uh, that sort of message for all. It has to do with how we, how we go about politics and practicing politics. And um, as I said earlier, it's not, you know, okay, well, we're Christians, we're rights. What's what can we say that that is that does resonate with the country as a whole and that is healing with the country as a whole? Well, one thing that we have to say is just what Father Malone has written about and has talked about, namely, truth is from the standpoint of Christianity. You should <laughs> explain this better than I can. But truth is not an ideology. It's certainly not a political ideology. Truth is a person, and the person is Christ, and, and whom we meet in love, and through whom we meet others in love. A second point is that um, that um, to to understand that our political opponent, somebody who d totally disagrees with us, is made in the image of God. This is a child of God we're talking about. It's not a thing. It's not a po political position. This is a human being created in the image of God. And finally, it's a message of humility. Because when we put central in our lives politics, a political position, a political party, a political ideology, when we do that, we have created an idol. And so there's so much in particularly the Hebrew Bible about idolatry. Well, right now, in, you know, in America, in, in, in the 21st century, people are not creating idols out of silver and out of gold. They're creating idols out of ideologies and, and 
positions that they put first and foremost in their lives. So this message of humility is a very important one. And to, to say, as Isaiah did, my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. It, it's very important to understand our human limitations and to represent that to the uh, country as a whole. Mm -hmm. Father Malone, do you want to respond further to that? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, um, I, and actually, I will say a word about abortion, because I think that is an interesting, that question uh, and, and how, it's, how it's dealt with in our politics is a big part. It, it, it's a symptom of the problem, um, by which I mean, you know, we were talking earlier about how uh, a majority of Americans don't see themselves in either of these political parties. Right? And yet, you know, we have one party that says there ought to be abortion unrestricted and on demand. And we have another that says it ought to be as restricted as much as possible. Right? The vast majority of the American people don't feel, don't associate themselves with either of those positions. They occupy some middle ground. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that they're confused uh, morally uh, because they're wrestling with the morality of the question and there, there are competing goods and there, um, there, there are competing values at stake here or if they're not in direct competition, they're at least in tension with one another. And the American people sense that. And, you know, their, their, their feelings about this issue in, the rain, in, in addition to a number of others are not extreme. And yet uh, how it's presented in the, in the partisan makeup of our national politics is, is only in an extreme way. And so that to me is a very indicative of the problem. There, there is, there's, there's not even, there's no space in between the extremes where we can debate and talk through these issues. And to the point that Senator Danforth was making, as Christians approach that conversation, um, presuming that space exists and we, we enter into it, we, we have to enter into it in, as I said in that piece, in that penitential key. And um, something that Senator Danforth said is absolutely correct. I mean, for a Christian, truth is ultimately a person. One is the way, truth, and the life. And that means, that means two things. That means we never possess the truth. We, we simply dare to hope that he possesses us, that he possesses our hearts. And if we don't enter into the public discourse uh, from that mindset, from that sort of fundamental reality, then we're more likely to do harm than good. And the second thing that that the, the ultimate reality of truth being a person for Christians means is the Christians don't even don't just believe that Jesus is um, uh, you know the message of God for for Christians um, or it's certainly I should say for for Roman Catholics Jesus Christ is both the revelation of God uh, itself and the means of that revelation. And so when, when Christians enter into the public discourse, we have to remember that it's not just, in, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not good enough to be right. You also have to be charitable because if the means and the content of revelation are the same in the person that we seek to serve, um, then nothing that is uh, nothing can ultimately be called truthful, even if it's factually accurate, if it's not spoken in charity. Mm. Because how we say things is as important as what we say, because it was for God. Uh, I really appreciate that. And, you know, to sort of tie your point about charity into Senator Danforth about humility, and this goes back to your points about abortion, I guess, you know, it always strikes me one of the problems that we have is that political opponents call each other names um, and call each other's positions names. And so uh, pro-choice activists often, you know, refuse to use the term pro-life. They say anti-choice, uh, they call their opponents that. And pro-life uh, folks don't always call their opponents pro-choice, they call them pro-abortion, you know, which a lot of pro-choice people say is, is inaccurate. And, you know, there are other terms like this, like identity politics. I think that, you know, oftentimes 
there's a conservative argument against identity politics. And it's a pejorative, you know, people involved in Black Lives Matter don't think of themselves as doing identity politics, they're, they're, they're working for equal rights and, and for justice. So it seems to me that one of the, you know, practical things people could do in the spirit of charity and humility is not call each other names or, or minimize the concerns, uh, you know, of the other side, on either side, and both sides uh, do this, as you pointed out. Um, one of our, one of our uh, listeners um, wrote in advance to ask an important question, and this is coming up in the Q&A a bit too, and it has to do with racism. Um, and this person put it this way, racism and bias are obviously baked into every aspect of our society. How will better interpersonal relations help eliminate the policies and practices of systemic racism? You know, how do we make that connection? So. Senator, maybe I'll start with you and then Father Malone, if you'd like to speak to that too, just one of the central issues of our, of our moment. We have, uh, we certainly have a history in our country, a uh, history of slavery, a history of Jim Crow, a history that has created disadvantage um, for African-Americans that is baked into America today. There's no doubt about that. And it's measurable. It's measurable by health, by life expectancy, by education, by income, by anything, everything else that, that we could imagine. So it's a very real problem. I think that the overwhelming majority of people in our country are good people. And the overwhelming majority of, of uh, people in our country are fair people. And they, they want to treat others fairly. And when they see a problem, they want to do what they can to fix it. So I think that it's important to appeal to that basic goodness, not assume that the person next to you is a racist but assume that this is a good person who wants to be part of the solution and is, is not personally part of the problem. So that, that to me is, it's, it's, it's recognizing the goodness. On the question, when you mentioned on abortion, so there's this wonderful thing, I think I wrote about it in, in a book, there was this marvelous, marvelous person named Loretta Wagner. And she was the head of the Missouri Citizens for Life. So she was a very devout Roman Catholic and very much into pro-life and was a person who organized the January trips to Washington, great person. And she had the idea of reaching out to the head of the largest abortion clinic in our state and she contacted this other woman and they started meeting together and they started breaking bread together and they're with their spouses starting just to talk about other things about their children and their families and what they really care about. From that relationship grew some practical answers to specific issues so that the abortion clinic also uh, became an adoption center as well. It offered opportunities for, for adoption and very specific things that they were able to work together. So it was taking even the most, maybe the most divisive issue of them all and, and looking at it from an interpersonal basis. And what can we do personally? I think that that's true of race. And I think that it's true about a lot of what divides our country. Can we figure out ways that we can get together, meet together, break bread together in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that turns out to be healing? And I think the answer to that is yes. And I think it's very important. Father Malone? Yeah, I would say that uh, 
that kind of work, that interpersonal work, dialogue, sitting down, people, not ideas, but people, and not ideas of people, but actual people, and and talking through these difficult issues is not just uh, helpful, it's absolutely indispensable. Um, I mean, my, I, I, you know, I also worked in politics for a while. I'm not at the level that the uh, Senator Danforth did, but, uh, you know, I worked for Congress for a while and, um, you know, I was uh, in my own marginal way, part of the uh, making change. And in, at the end of the day, real change happens from a change of hearts and hearts are changed by other hearts. That's just the way the world really works in the end. Um, you know, the reason why there is an acceptance of uh, gay and lesbian relationships in this country today is because people started coming out in the 1980s and 90s and so forth. And, and, and other people then realized, oh my gosh, this is a member of my family. This is my friend. This is, and all of a sudden this idea became personalized um, and it, it, it changed. It changed people changed hearts. You know, a lot of people tend to think that that is, that papers over our differences, that means that we don't fight for what we believe in, that we can't bring the prophetic element of the Christian tradition into the discourse. Um, it means exactly the opposite. It's what makes genuine argument and disagreement possible, is that interpersonal piece, that heart-to-heart -heart conversation, where you can disagree, you can, you can fight for different outcomes, but you don't hate each other. Um, and because at the end of the day, if, if that's where we end up, then we, we have not succeeded in undoing uh, racism of any kind because it's rooted in hate, right? The other thing I would say is I, I myself, um, I, you know, I mean, I'm a white man. I grew up in a middle-class family in Massachusetts. And, you know, when all of this was happening last summer, I, I wrote, an article for my readers and was called an open letter to white America. Not all of my readers are white, but a lot of them are. And I was writing to them and I said, this was my experience of this. And, you know, there's value to ideas of systems and philosophies and all the rest. But I think that what I wanted to, to, to introduce to them was a, a, a personal language, a way of talking about this um, that could help them make sense of these things in their own lives. So I talked about, you know, growing up in a family where some, some, some of my family were prejudiced and they used language that is com completely unacceptable and how I responded to that and how I didn't respond to that. I tried to do that in an honest way and, and how I think that the, you know, the reality of the, the history of race in this country has, a, has, you know, has shaped my own worldview for good and ill. And what I saw in the responses to that piece were a lot of people disagreed, a lot of people agreed, but it was hard to agree or disagree because we were talking about our experience. Mm -hmm. and, and what I found there was that the piece gave people a lot of, gave them permission to talk about their experience in a way that for whatever reason they didn't feel they had before. And people said, yeah, well, you know what? I had a grandmother and, I, and this is what I also experienced in my own life. And I think that that kind of work it's absolutely critical. Um, hearts are changed by hearts. And so are minds, by the way. Minds aren't well, more often changed by hearts than minds. Mm. Hearts are changed by hearts and so are minds. That's lovely. I mean, I think what both of you are talking about is intentional conversation and the cultivation really of um, ultimately relationships. Mm -hmm. And I know the two of you are in conversation constantly sort of, you know, working through your ideas about this. And, um, you know, I, I'd be interested, I know our, our, our attendees are always wanting more in terms of practical solutions. You know, we can all agree that this would be better. We can all agree that these values would be better, but how in our daily lives do we do that? So Senator, again, I'll, I'll start with you just to think, you know, how, what takeaways would you give uh, to, to folks here um, who really believe in, in much of what you all are saying, but, you know, maybe need more practical thoughts about that? I think what we need is a broad-based 
public uh, movement that enlists just a lot of people. So it's not a matter of, you know, a couple of people talking about this, but something very practical to do. So um, Father Malone and I have been in contact with uh, a man named Adam Hamilton, and he's, he is the pastor of the largest United Methodist Church in the world that's outside of Kansas City. And um, so we've been thinking together, well, okay, is there some practical thing, little thing? but something that, that has real impact. Last, I think it was last Christmas time, Adam Hamilton and his church, they, they made yard signs and t-shirts and the yard sign said, love your neighbor. That's what they said, love your neighbor. Well, now that's something real, you know? It, it says something, it says something very meaningful. There was a story not long ago in one of the newspapers about these two families in Pittsburgh. One was a Republican family, one was a Democratic family, one was for Trump, one was for Biden. And they got to know each other and not talking about politics, just know each other as families. So they had these yard signs outside their house, Trump, Biden, but they also had yard signs with arrows pointing to each other's home. And the yard sign said, we heart them. Okay. Now, that's kind of a neat little thing. And to figure out ways to replicate that. So it just puts us in, put, puts in our minds the, the idea that we should treat people as friends and not as enemies. Father Malone. Yeah, I would say, I, you know, the founder of the Jesuits, the Catholic order that I belong to, San Ignatius, was a very practical person. And uh, he understood human behavior very well, I, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm now uh, showing that Jesuits aren't the most modest people in the world. But um, <laughs> he had... Uh, he had practical suggestions for things like this. So he said, you know, if, if, if you feel blocked, like you feel like you're being pulled into something negative and you go out of your way to try the positive, right? Um, and if, even if you don't have the grace of loving your neighbor that you disagree with, uh, you, can, you can still act in a way that you think you would act if you did, right? <laughs> so try that. And that can, that can mean anything. But it, it, in this context, it could mean, uh, you know, go, we go out of our way to, to read reasonable people with whom we disagree. Like, uh, let's break up our news feeds and expose ourselves to opinions of people who are saying something important that um, we may disagree with, but, you know, place ourselves in a position to hear it. Um, it means going out of our way to, to meet people that we disagree with. You know, the 2016 election was one of the closest in American history. And, uh, you know, 60% of Americans live in a congressional district that voted for Trump or Clinton by 20 points or more, right? So we don't even live in the same neighborhood as the people with whom we disagree. Mm -hmm. so, but try to go out and find them. And then as the Senator said, when you do, don't talk about politics right off the, right off the bat. Get to know each other, have a cup of coffee, Ask them what's important in their life and how their family's doing, how their work is. Um, and then when, as a third step, practical step, when you do get to the conversation about policy, listen for values. Listen for values. What is the value that this person is expressing that's behind their position with which I disagree? Because more often than not, you're going to realize that you actually have the same values in common but you're applying them in very different ways. But if you can agree on that, it creates a space where you can, you can now talk about how you disagree on how you apply it. The, the problem with the, the discourse right now is there's all of this motive question in our political conversation. And, and we call into question, not just the position that our opponent takes 
uh, or our interlocutor, we call into question their values, whether they believe, wh whether they're decent human beings. I just say as a last thought that the, um, for another article that I'm writing, I, I recently revisited President Kennedy's address at American University in the spring of 1963, where he departed from the post-war policy uh, of confrontation with the Soviet Union and called for us to rethink our engagement with the Soviet Union. And he said in that address, um, because you know, at the end of the day, we all breathe the same air. We all inhabit this small planet. We all cherish our children's futures and we are all mortal. And in the context of, so in the context of this huge Cold War uh, clash of the superpowers in which people older than I were taught that the Soviet Union were evil, terrible, awful, uh, we had to defeat them, um, absolutely. He was calling us to recognize their humanity. And I thought, gee, if Americans could do that with somebody, with, with, with a foreign enemy, we ought to be able to do that with our fellow Americans. I might uh, uh, add just a couple of thoughts. One is um, just in interpersonal relations, don't pounce on the other guy. I think that there is, I mean, you see this a lot and you see it in politics, you see it in culture of, of looking, of sort of combing through everything anybody has ever said in his or her history, looking for the worst possible interpretation and just jumping on it. So I think that a degree of forgiveness and just treating people as though, okay, I'm not just gonna look for the worst and pounce on you. I'm going to look for the best and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very forgiving and generous in my treatment of you. And then a second thought that I have is the ability to laugh, the ability to laugh with each other. It was such a big deal back in, you know, in my, in my days in the Senate, I mean, we had good laughs right across party lines. I talked to a, an incumbent Senator who said, you know, we never laugh. And the reason is we're afraid we're going to be tape recorded and it's going to be whatever we say is going to be used against us in the next campaign. So when you think of and one of the great examples of humor, of two people who disagreed on politics in general, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. I mean, they laughed with each other and they liked each other and they disagreed with each other and government worked. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, just thinking about these small things that people can, can do in their everyday lives. It, you know, it's been a rough few years though, you know, and somebody just wrote in to the Q and A and said, you know, specific political policies really do have life shattering consequences for people. And so that's the difficult thing is that I don't think people now see their political opponents, you know, as wanting to get to the same goal, but maybe in different ways, they really see them as pursuing an evil path or pursuing a path that's going to do damage to others. So we're really in a bind, I think right now. And, and you know, after recent, years. And, uh, you know, these things that you all are suggesting, I think are very helpful. But the healing, I think will take a while. Um, so we're coming to the end of our of our hour here, I just like to invite each of you to maybe uh, any final thoughts, uh, some hopeful takeaways uh, to to give to our audience, you've you've said so much already, but uh, Father Malone, maybe I'll start with you on this one. Uh, some some final thoughts. Sure. Um, you know, I, I was just thinking about uh, what Senator Danforth said. Um, he said, you know, don't, don't just bash somebody over the head when you find out that they have a different opinion than you do. Um, and, you know, I think that, that he, he put that in his, in, his, in his very down to earth Missouri way. <laughs> but uh, the, the theological piece behind that is for Christians is really, really important. And that is, um, you know, we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to be holy, not necessarily right. I mean, we can have all the right answers, but if we're asking the wrong question, it doesn't matter. 
And we can have all of the right answers, but if we're not loving and forgiving people, if we are not uh, generous in spirit, if we are not civil, then we will have failed because that those are necessary components of all of this, right? And that's what we're ultimately called to. And uh, the, the last thing I would say is uh, I, I appreciate that, the, the comment that uh, one of our viewers uh, gave, the, the stakes are very, very high. And yes, policy decisions have real consequences. They can, have, they can, they can liberate people and they can destroy lives and, and communities. If you, if you get it wrong. It's also the case that that has always been true. That has always been true throughout the history of the United States. The, the Constitution itself, as we well know, is a flawed doctrine. Um, the, there's the, but the three-fifths compromise was an attempt to limit the power of slave-holding states, um, not to expand them. Politics is not the forum for uh, the for cleansing the world of evil. Um, it's not capable of that. But it is a forum in which we can, to the best of our ability, find ways of living together in peace um, and of, of, of helping people who live on the margins of society to find their way through the center of it. Um, but that requires debate, it requires compromise, and it requires something which we did have throughout much of the history of this country until the last 20 or 30 years, and that is a, a willingness to engage in a, in a spirited argument um, about uh, public policy that didn't call into question the, the values, the motive, the character of our interlocutors, our opponents. Thank you. Senator? Well, thank you, Marie, for organizing this. and. Thanks to Father Malone for being a part of it. He really is terrific. I love being on programs with Father Malone. I, 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 when I, I told him before this, I said, I don't know what I'm going to say, except I agree with Father Malone. But he is, he is so good and so bright, and it's, it's just wonderful to be on a program with him. So I think this. I think that a great national purpose of America is very simple and it's to hold ourselves together as one country with all of our differences, with all of our different interests, with all of our different political views, simply to hold ourselves together. And that was what the framers of the constitution were about, to build a structure which was able to contain within itself all of the differences of our country. We have more differences now than we had then, but it's still our purpose, e pluribus unum. We are many, hold ourselves together as one. And we seem to be falling apart as a country. We seem to be fracturing and falling apart and at each other's throats and politically so polarized and so divided. And it is not healthy for America. So I think that our ministry as faithful people is to heal, heal our country, hold ourselves together, make us, you know, in Christ we are one. And, and to have that message as our ministry to the country, not that we're proselytizing people, but again, as our message, our gift that that we are ministers of reconciliation. It's a very, very big deal. And if it does not, if this message doesn't come from religious people, I don't think it's gonna come from anybody. So I think that we have a real responsibility for to America at a very difficult time for our country. Well, Thank you. And I want to thank all of our patient participants uh, who are here with us. We can't see your faces. We look forward to seeing your faces again in future. We can see your name. So thank you all for being here. Thanks to Provost Wendland for starting us off. Sandy Jones, Deborah Kennard, and Jonathan Goldstein for helping our webinar run so smoothly. And above all, thank you, Senator John Danforth and Father Matt Malone for a wonderful conversation. Yeah, I, can I, I thank you. Uh, 
uh, to the center uh, and for, for having me as part of this conversation. And thanks to Senator Tanforth. People always ask uh, what, how, we, how we're different. I say, well, he's reverend and honorable and I'm reverend, but not honorable. <laughs> <laughs> I have tremendous respect for you, Jack, and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this project with you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all so much, and good night. Good night.